Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom and welcome. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is Valley Beth Shalom Torah study for a Shabbos morning. Joined this morning by my teacher and friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman from South Florida and the Aspen Jewish Congregation. Welcome, Mark. Nice to have you here. Good Shabbos, Ed. Good Shabbos, Mark. It's great to be together. And then this morning we are in deepest, darkest Vayikra. We are deep into the book of Leviticus. Uh, the beginning of the book of Leviticus, as we've spoken before, is a kind of tech manual for the priesthood. It's a kind of technical document showing all the sacrifices that were necessary for the ancient, uh, first the Mishkan and then the ancient temple, and all of the details of those sacrifices. This morning, the, the Parsha begins with an industrial accident during the consecration of the priests, Aaron and his sons, two of the priests, two of his sons, his first and second born son, enter the Mishkan. The Torah says, with Eish Zara, strange fire, and a flame comes from God and consumes them. And then Moses changes his role, tries to become the comforter of his brother and a family, trying to bring the community back together after this horrifying episode. And then the book sort of not so subtly goes back to its original theme, back to the theme of, of what's allowed and what's not allowed, how we're to conduct ourselves. And it deals with the laws of kosher, the laws of the dietary laws of the Jewish people with a catalog of the animals that were permitted to eat and the animals that were not permitted to eat. Vayikra, the book of Leviticus has a, has a vision has, a, has an obsession rather, an obsession with the body. The sacrifices we're talking about are all the bodies of animals that are hacked to pieces and burned. It's gonna talk about what we eat and what we don't eat. It's gonna talk about sexual relations that are acceptable and sexual relations that are not acceptable. It's gonna talk about diseases of the body. It's gonna talk about emissions of the body. There is this powerful sense that the body is the locus of either the most, the, the body is the locus of something which can be very dangerous, that has to be regulated, that has to be contained, that boundaries have to be maintained between inside and outside, between you and me, that passions have to be regulated. You're not allowed to just have sex with anybody. You're not allowed to eat just anything. Things are very carefully regulated and kept in order. You really have a sense that this book was written by somebody who was terrified of disorder and chaos, terrified of the mess of life. And so what this book does is create a highly articulated religious system as a sort of answer to the chaotic mess of all the rest of life. And the, the category that the book uses is a category which is unique to Leviticus it's Tame and Tahor. And the reason I'm not translating it is because all the translations are wrong. Tame and Tahor is sometimes translated as unclean and clean, impure and pure. Tahor means one is permitted to participate in the ritual life of the community and has stayed away from boundary violations. And Tame is the person who has engaged those boundary violations and is temporarily kept away from the religious life of the community. So if a person encounters a dead body, they are tame. When a woman gives birth to a child, she is tame. If a person has some sort of bodily emission, some fluid that should be in the body that comes out of the body, that person is tame. And then the animals we deal with today with this kosher law, some of the animals are described as tahor and some of the animals are described as Tame. So Mark, the question is, what does this mean? <laughs> what do we do with this? Is there any modern analog, any way of understanding what the Torah is reaching for when it teaches us that all these different categories of experience make a person Tame, and these other categories of experience render that person Tahor? How do you read this? Boy, that is... <clears throat> That's a, a 10 on the scale of deep, problematic essentialness. That's one of the great questions. And it actually, confronting it, 
I would say it's the, the let me say, start it this way. The French existentialist philosopher Gabriel Marcel once made a distinction between problems and mysteries. And he said, these are the questions we encounter in life. Everything is a problem or a mystery. A problem is something external to us that we lay siege to. And when we find the answer, it goes away. It's completely external to us. For example, uh, before Lavoisier, the French chemist, people thought that combustion was caused by a substance that no one had ever seen called phlogiston, and that caused combustion. Then Lavoisier comes along and says, no, oxygen causes combustion. And they looked at his experiments and they said, yeah, you're right. And that was the end of the problem of what caused combustion. What causes combustion is a problem. How far is the moon is a problem. What's the cure for cancer is a problem. All of these are external to us. Some we have answers to. Some like the cure for cancer, we don't have answers yet. But we know that the question has nothing to do with our, our kishkis, nothing to do with our spiritual life. It's, it's a question outside us. That's a problem. A mystery, he, the way he says it, is not something we constitute, but something within which we are constituted. That means a question like, is there meaning in life? Is goodness rewarded? Who wrote the book of love? <laughs> These questions are mysteries and they will never be, it's not that they will never be solved, they never will be solved because when, but it's that it's something different. They are about us. They're about what we already, what we believe and how we fit, how our beliefs fit into the world and, and what we're capable of believing. That's, that's what a mystery is. Something we live our way, as the poet Rilke said, we, we don't answer these things, we live our way into the answer. And, and so what you're asking, purity and impurity, and I think those two English words come closest. I know none of them are good. You're right in, in saying that, in translating Tomei and Tahor. But, rit, but purity, spiritual or ritual purity, and impurity, I think, come closest. And I would say that the great catastrophe of modern religious life, not just in Judaism, but in all the Western faiths is the, is forgetting, abandoning, surrendering the concept of purity. Purity does not mean dirty. We have to make that very clear again to people. If you fall into a pool of mud, you're dirty, but you're not impure. But if you do something that you, I think, brilliantly describe as a, as a spiritual boundary violation, you are impure. So the question I then pose back to you, is there anything that you or I or people we know would call impure? Is there something where you say, I won't do this or that, not because it's ethically wrong, not because it'll make me physically dirty, but because it's impure. I have a few, I have a few suggestions. Let me throw them out. The first that I would put on the list of modern phenomena that are best described as, as impure would be pornography. I think pornography is wrong, not only because it exploits women and objectifies women or men who are involved in as sex workers or producers of pornographic 
videos and things. It's that it separates sex and love. And that is an impure act because sex is connected to love. That's the way God made it. That it should, it's not like burping. It's not a physical thing. It's physical, but it's, it's emotional, it's spiritual. And when you split them apart by simply showing the sex act and dividing it from love, I think that's impure. Um, let, I me, would, let, me, let me add something to that. Can okay, I add something? So that's one suggestion. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree because I, I think that you're, you're exactly right. And not just is it impure because it separates sex and love. Um, the tendency, and I, I'm, it's a bad judgment, and I know this is a generalization, but it's a, the tendency in pornography is to tend toward violence toward women. That there's a tremendous and, and I'm I'm I would I would say I would add to your category a different kind of pornography a pornography of violence yes a violence horror, right there are right. horror movies out there slash rated PG you know chainsaw yeah. massacre things in which the thrill of watching people's bodies be destroyed in front of your eyes the thrill of of horrifying acts of violence. And, and here, I think that, you know, and that, that we would get an entertainment, a thrill of, 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 I mean, they're looking for a sort of adrenaline response, and that's what they get from these movies, which is why I guess they're popular. But there's something horrifying to watching pain being inflicted on human beings and taking joy from. And it's here, I, I would impure. connect that. It's impure. I, but see, I would connect that with a ritual thing, incidentally. And, and I've written about this in my, in my book. Um, when we are told to separate milk from meat, which is a pain to do, by the way, I mean, you have two sets of dishes and pots and pans and silverware. And my whole life, I was taught to, you know, ask, is it a fleshic fork or a milchic fork, right? The symbolism of that, of course, is to separate that within us, which gives life. Milk, after all, is the symbol of motherhood, of giving life, from that which takes life, which is meat, which is involving an act of violence. And the deeper meaning of that is to try to, it's to pay attention to the idea of where violence is used as a form of fun, of thrill, of entertainment, of stimulation, of inspiration. And, it, it, and to, to separate violence from entertainment, to me is I think what milk and meat, that separation is supposed to be teaching us to notice the violent aspects of my character and learn how to delimit and discipline that and to expand the nurturing part of my character and learn how to, um, how to enhance and to enrich that part of myself. So I, I would lump into pornography horror movies. I would lump into pornography a lot of sport in which violence is the essence of the sport. Now, yeah, football, like that wrestling stuff. Football is a very violent sport, but that's not the essence of the sport. But many other sports are, are simply about the infliction of pain of one human being on another. I think that's brilliant. And, and so there we, we have the beginning of a modern list of... Of a theory of impurity. Spiritual, a modern theory of impurity. What so else are you going to say? Pornography, we have violence. What other things would you add to the list? Well, I, I tend toward the ethical. You know, and, and the question of certain ethical or moral acts, immoral acts specifically, where, where I might not be affecting anybody else, but it affects me. It makes me a certain kind of person. And I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to. I remember once when I was a kid in a, in a grocery store, a drug store, and the clerk gave my father too much change back. He, He'd given the man a $10 bill and the man made a mistake and thought it was a 20 and gave him back. And my father stopped him and said, no, that's wrong. You don't owe me this. And the guy said, oh, my God, thank you. And I asked my pop, you know, as a kid would, you know, like, pop, why didn't you like take it? It would have been free. You would have gotten. And he said, because I'm not that kind of person. And that was there was such a lesson in that. I'm not that, I, because it would stain my character. It would somehow stain my soul. I'm not that kind of person. That's beautiful. That's and really good. So there's I, a tame tahor element to that, to that kind of ethic. Okay, good. Let me add 
Let me add another suggestion to our impurity list, because I don't want people to think, well, slashers and mass murdering and all that. Okay, it's easy to get your head around the idea that's impure. But little things can be impure, and they can lead you to bigger things. For example, I consider littering to be impure. It's not just illegal, it's against the law to litter. It's not just wrong, it schmutzes up the environment. But it, it pollutes, it's, it's a violation of our social contract that we're supposed to take care of stuff and not make it worse because we were there. I think that's another impurity. I would add another thing, and I struggle with this, cursing. I would say the crude use of language. I swear too much. I don't swear a lot, but I, outside the window is the eighth green, and I missed a two-foot putt over there the other day. And, and I, what I said was not rabbinic, and it was not pure, and it wasn't good. And I think a lot of us are too loose with vulgarities and swearing and Again, it sounds prudish when you make this list to some people, but I, I think it's it, it's not so. And and one of the reasons why I think contemporary music, particularly hip hop and rap, which are not my favorite genres, I'm trying to understand their artistic value, but their use of their use of the N word, their use of other curses and derogatory words about women. I think that's impure. It's, it's, it's an aesthetic issue. If you like it, you like it. It's not like stealing something. I would also say gossip is impure. Wait, wait, before you go on, let, let me stop a second, because there's a really wonderful, I think, reference back to Leviticus, back to Vayikra. So Vayikra, again, is is somehow already obsessed with the body and it's obsessed with bodily functions. And it's, its aim is to try to keep things in their proper place. And bodily functions have a proper place. All of them do. And part of the problem with cursing, isn't it interesting that the most cursing curse words have to do with bodily functions? That the word for sexual contact is is the most powerful word that we use and the yeah, second one is a word for defecation which is the second most powerful word that we use i mean it's so interesting that you take these things which ought to be in a special place fascinating yes that sexual contact belongs between loving responsible partners who are sharing their souls along with sharing their bodies and by the way our tradition celebrates that that when two partners are prepared to share their souls in care and love and responsibility, they should enjoy the contact of the body and all the pleasure that it brings in its place with a sense of dignity and privacy and not outside of its place. But then we take those words and we bring them outside into the public sphere and they become curse words. And the same thing with defecation, which is a bodily function which frankly all of us know is one of the most liberating things we do every single day. And it belongs in a certain place. It doesn't need to be brought outside of the realm of the private. But when you do bring it out, then it becomes a curse word. Things in their place are tahor. Things crossing a boundary where they don't belong becomes tame. Yeah, but how do you deal? Okay, let's now go ahead with gossip. Then I'll give you my theory of Tame and Tahoe. Okay, Go fine. Ahead. Well, I think gossip is impure because, you know, it's uh, lush and hara. It's specifically prohibited. But it makes, it makes you feel different. It makes you feel dirty to hear stuff like this. Well, it should. I, I think habitual gossips don't feel dirty. Right. right. Yet people who are gossip mongers. No, they, they do, but they enjoy it. They get a thrill out of it. The well, same you know what I think? They get a thrill out of slasher movies. Well, I think, well, you're yeah. out of bad word. We call them dirty words, but that's what they are. Yeah, I agree. But I also think it's about power. It's about saying, I know something about so-and-so, and I'm going to tell you this about so-and-so, which puts them in the middle of the conversation as the dispenser of secret knowledge, 
which is an act of power. But it's a, an act of violence and destruction. I, I would agree with that. I would revert back to my moral category for a moment. Um, I live in Los Angeles. We have 61,000 people who live on the streets of LA. They're unhoused, they're homeless. You can't go almost anywhere, including the nicest neighborhoods of this city, without seeing hordes of tents and shopping carts and the, the signs of people living out on the street. And in order to live that way, you have to learn how not to see it. You have to pass by. You have to close your eyes and, and look past it. And eventually those people become invisible. And I think that's a category of Tame also. Yes. That when I fail to see a fellow human being and I fail to feel anything for them, they become just a nuisance to me because they're, they dirty the street or they're in my way. And it doesn't become something that I have any kind of Rahmanis for, any kind of compassion or empathy or feeling. Yes, they are. They do make a mess in our neighborhoods. Don't write me and get angry. And I know that. But on the other hand, we need to find a solution for this. We need to find help for these people because they're human beings. And yes, some of them happen to be drug addicted and mentally ill, and many of them want to live on the street, but many of them, many, many, many of them don't. And they're the victims of a housing economy, which is a mess. And it's those people that I think we have to reach out for. But every time we walk past them, I feel, I feel less than. I feel less than the person I'm supposed to be. I feel tame. Yeah, I agree. And there's a wonderful Reb Nachman story uh, about that precise point. He's walking along the streets of Bratislava and is with his Hasidim and, and he comes up short stops and points across the road and says to the point of them says who's that across the road and they look and they said Rebbe it's nobody it's just Moishala the the Vasatraga the, the water drawer it's it's nobody it's just Mo, it's Moisha that's all that's who's over there and he, he says none of you are my students none of you are my students anymore and they're they're crying, they're hysterical. They've just been excommunicated by their Rebbe. And they said, why, what, what did we do? And he said, none of you are my students until you can look across the street and whoever you see, when you're asked, who is that? You must respond this way. Oh, Rebbe, that is the image of God across the street. Mm. That is the image of God. Right, and the Heschel story, the famous Heschel story that he's walking home from Shul Shabbos with one of his students and he's approached by a beggar, by a panhandler. And the panhandler says, yeah, hey man, can you give me a quarter for a cup of coffee? And Heschel comes over and he puts his hand on the man's shoulder and he says, my brother, it's the Shabbos and I don't carry money and I apologize. But if you'll meet me back here tomorrow, my brother, I'll have that quarter for you and even more. And the beggar looks at him with tears in his eyes and says, no, Rabbi, I'm sorry. I should have known that it was the Sabbath for you. But the fact that you called me brother is worth so much more to me than any money that I could collect it today. There's something there. There's a, there's a connection between the ethical and the spiritual, the ethical and the ritual, which I think is very powerful. I want to suggest a different one. Let, let me suggest a different way to read the same categories of Tameh and Tahor, okay? Remember that the, 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 the meaning of this, the functional meaning of this in the Bible, if you are our Tameh, you're not permitted to bring sacrifices. Only a person who is Tahor is permitted to bring sacrifices. And bringing a sacrifice means participating in the ritual life of the community, okay? Now, if you look carefully at the ritual, at the, at the category, what you discover is that for most, the most part, not always, but for the most part, one becomes tame when co one comes into contact with the edges of being, with birth and with death. A, a woman is tame when she has her menstrual period. A woman is tame after she gives birth. A man is tame after a seminal emission. A person is tame if they come across a dead body if they're in the presence of death. Uh, a person is tame if they have a bodily emission which bespeaks a deadly disease. 
It's when we come in contact with the edges of birth and death, we become tame. Now, I'm going to suggest here it's not a punishment. It's actually a recognition that when we come in contact with birth and with death, with the beginning of our being and the end of our being, with the fact that we are mortal, that we are finite, that our time here in the world is limited, and that as bodies in the world, we're very vulnerable. We feel differently about things. The world feels differently. You, you and I are rabbis, and we spend too much time at the cemetery. And I'm sure you're like me, that even when I come home from a simple funeral service, someone who lived a long, beautiful life, and we all had wonderful things to say about them, it takes me a while to come back to the world. I can't deal with the trivialities of my job or my family or my world. I can't pay the gas bill you know, right away. I need a little time to sort of re-enter the world because there's a shakiness that comes when we confront death. And the same thing happens when birth happens, right? That when, when a new life comes in the world and we are there to touch it and to be part of it, there's a difference of how we feel. And I think that what the Torah might be saying is that for people who feel that way, they don't need the ritual. They already have a sense of God's closeness because it's at the cemetery or in the maternity room that we have a sense that God is here with us in some fashion, that the boundaries of human existence are not bound by the finitude of our lives, but there's something so much more going on in life. We don't need the ritual, so that's why we don't participate in them but it's for everybody else. It's for all the rest of us who go nine to five at work and drive carpool and listen to the Dodger game and, and are just, you know, it, that, that life is sort of routine and normal. We need to be woken up to the finitude of life and the majesty and the miracle of being alive. And that's what sacrifice does because it brings you into the contact with something dead, with, with the, the process of killing an animal, which leaves you a little shaky. And so Tame and Tahor, it's not a value judgment. It's a functional judgment. These are people who need the ritual, and these are people who don't. And here, too, I have to tell you that there's sometimes when I feel Tame because things have happened to me, and I just know that I'm not right. I can't, you know, I can't go right back to the routines of life. I need a little time. I need a buffer because I've just confronted something profoundly existential, profoundly shaking of my existence in the world, I need a buffer. And that's what Tame might mean. Yeah. And, and I think it's important for our students also to understand that this isn't a Jewish thing. This is Jewish, but the concept of Tame and Tahor is in every single religion and in every single culture. And when you go, for example, to Aboriginal tribes, and, and the, the anthropologist Bernard Malinowski was the first one to coin the term taboo. The taboo could be a rock, a mountain, a tree, a something that was in the box, in the, in the taboo box. You can't touch that. You can't come near that because that's taboo. And, and it's, it's, it's that kind of idea. I think what is impossible, of course, to know what God was thinking about this, but I think it's deeper than something God created. I think it's about uh, the fact that we are partly spiritual and partly animal. Mm. And animals know that there's certain areas you don't go. There's certain things you don't touch, certain plants you don't eat, certain things you don't do. It's, it's our animal nature, which includes this concept of purity and impurity. And, and I think when people give themselves a chance to allow the concepts of purity and impurity to come back into their life, they'll stop feeling like they're old fashioned or prudish or not hip, but they'll say, I've heard them, I've heard the phrase, you know, that's not my lane. That's not my vibe. You know, okay, however you want to say it, it's fine with me. But basically, they're, they're saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be involved in eating something that was once that felt pain when, when it was killed, so that I could have a lunch. 
that that makes me feel impure and the vegetarians that have the most impact on me and as i struggle with trying to integrate that into my own diet um the vegetarians that have the most impact are the ones who don't go to the argument oh it's destroying the earth and the cow's flatulence is destroying the ozone layer all those arguments may be true but they just leave me cold the ones that reach my heart are the arguments that you said that i'm better than that this isn't my best self that i need to kill something for lunch i don't need to kill something for lunch and i can live on a higher level than i'm living now not the highest level i'm not good enough for that but i can live on a higher level and i think that's what people who are talking about a plant-based diet and talking about not eating meat as much as we do or not eating it at all that's what they're really getting at they're getting at a world in which we can be our best selves there's another heschel story i would close with which is told to me david novak told me the story that he was he actually heard it from heschel and he's teaching a class in talmud and and they're talking about blood in an egg and how the blood in an egg renders it uh tame trafe actually and he says so gentlemen you now are experts in identifying blood in an egg may you also be experts in identifying blood in money Hmm. yeah because here i think that's the one of the reasons one of the upshots one of the point the conclusions you draw from leviticus is that you don't separate spirituality from the life of the body i mean why is there a dietary law in a religion what does religion have to do with the way I eat? But that's right. the point. The way I eat is my transaction with nature. It is the way I'm going to deal with the natural world. And it's the way I'm going to consider my own selfhood as a body. And can I find spirituality in that? Can I find spirituality in the way that I spend money? Can I find spirituality in the way that I conduct myself as a sexual creature? Do I separate my spirit from my body during sex and let my body have its way and spirit stays pure while the body goes and has it? That's not the way the Torah wants us to do this. We are an integrated creature, body and soul. And your job is to take everything of the body and elevate. Your job is to elevate it. I mean, I think you've said this very nicely, Mark, right? Money can be a source of terrible evil or money can be elevated into tzedakah, into justice. Food can be a sign of our animality, right? Food can be fast food, you gobble up. Or gl- gluttony. Or gluttony, or food can be a suda, a meal where we share life, where we share conversation, where we share laughter, where we share tears. It's a sharing of life. Alcohol, drink, wine can make you into a beast or alcohol can be kiddish. It can be a symbol of our common, our bond with each other and the joy that we share in life. And sexuality, of course, can make us a beast or we become bestial in our sexual lives or sexuality can become kiddushin, which is the holiness of a bond between two loving partners. So what, what, the, what the book of Leviticus is trying to beg us to do is not separate spirituality from materiality. There actually isn't much of a word spirituality in Judaism. No. The way you live your life, because there's no such thing as spirit separated from body, right? It is the well, way- Well, there is, but that came way, with the rabbi. It's the way that you live life. And yes. it's, the, it's the bodily life that you live. And that I think has a lot to do with Tameh and Tahor. Well, thank you for this discussion, Amen. Martin. Amen, I want to wish you a very good Shabbos. This morning, uh, following our Torah study, Please stay tuned at 10 o'clock. Our, our minion this morning is from the Neshama Minion, uh, the beautiful musical women's minion led by my wife, Nina, and uh, Cindy Paley Abudi. And it's a beautiful musical minion. You're welcome to enjoy it. I'm here on Facebook and YouTube as well. Um, 
We dive in this afternoon, every morning at 7.30 in the morning, uh, Sunday at 8.30, every other morning at 7.30, every evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, on Wednesday evening, we continue with College of Jewish Studies. Our guest will be Professor Ethan Pack of UCLA, who's going to begin talking to us about Israeli identity through contemporary Israeli literature, film, and television. And please, please be informed that, that in the coming weeks, we're going to begin our Passover preparation. Mark, it's almost Pesach. Oh, my God. Oh, the price of briskets going up. Anyway, we're going to begin our Passover presentation on Thursday night, April 7th. I'll do a night of Pesach presentation online on Zoom, on Facebook and YouTube. Talk about how to lead a better Seder, the meaning, the deeper meaning of the Haggadah and what meaning we can find in the holiday. Thank you for being with us this morning. We wish everybody a really good Shabbos. Mark, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, Ed.